Uh, this is Joanne McManus from the Nebraska Library Commission, and I'm the project manager for the Library Innovation Studios project, which we are spearheading here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, I want to introduce our presenters today. Uh, Deborah Dragos is with me. She's also with the Nebraska Library Commission. And having her library background, we had asked her to help us develop uh, library Innovation Studios policies uh, because of her uh, library training. We also had assistance from Wax Wheeler, who is with uh, Nebraska Innovation Studio at the University of Nebraska, and he is our uh, designer here with our Library Innovations Project. So you'll see both the Nebraska Library Commission and the University of Nebraska uh, always helping on this particular project. Um, and of course, Max has the background of having worked at Makerspaces, mm -hmm. and so uh, that has been very helpful to us. I just want to mention our partners for our project uh, before we get into the meat of our uh, presentation today. Obviously, the Nebraska Library Commission uh, received a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, so we always want to thank IMLS. Um, Nebraska Extension and Nebraska Innovation Studio at the University uh, is also partners in the project and uh, help us throughout. And then, of course, the Nebraska Regional Library Systems are also partners. Uh, we also have a local partners, and you can get those local partners uh, at your library and add them as you go. Who is invited today to this particular webinar is uh, the library, the host libraries that will be upcoming for our cycles five, six, and seven through the end of the grant. Uh, this particular presentation will be on our website and will also be helpful to anybody who is setting up a makerspace. Mm -hmm. It won't necessarily have to be ours. Obviously, we wrote it uh, with our makerspaces in mind, uh, but these are just generally good uh, policies for makerspaces in general. Um, the resources that you have in front of you, and you can also find on our website, is uh, the Library Innovation Studio Policies. Uh, the current version was just revised, um, and you have those handouts. I sent those to you, but you can also get those off our website. And the Library Innovation Studio, you can really pictures there of those particular handouts. Hopefully you have them uh, with you, um, uh, but they will be available on our website as well. Okay, and really today's agenda is the summary of that uh, draft library innovation studio policy. But I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah to get us started. Uh, but we really will be, Max and I will be interjecting along the way um, because obviously we all have food. I <laughs> just can't wait to, to visit with you about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we actually looked at policies from about a dozen plus different libraries that have makerspaces, and we, if um, more than four or more of them had the same individual policy, you'll probably see it in our policies here. We picked what we thought would fit best with what we were trying, intending to do with this Makerspace Innovation Studio uh, project. So what we will, are asking you to do is to review the policies. Some of the policies that are here that we'll talk about today are actually required as part of the um, the grant. Two of them that are in red are optional, so that's up to you whether you decide to include those or not, and you may add other policies as desired, okay? Um, there are some blanks for you to fill in, and those are highlighted in blue. There are some instructions also um, either highlighted in yellow or the text is in red, and those sections uh, you will take out after as you are completing the policies. But once you have the finalized policy, you do need to have your board approve it, and then you will need to submit that approved policy to Joanne. Okay. 
we start off with general policies. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and in this PowerPoint presentation, we've mostly summarized the policies. We haven't put them up here word for word. So we start off with general things like posting the hours that the studio or equipment are available. We do realize that you might not have the staffing to actually um, have the equipment available to makers during all of the hours that your library is open or you may um, set up times outside of regular library hours to make that equipment available. So we just ask that you actually post what hours will be available, the equipment will be available to the makers. The agreement is that you do not charge for the use of any of this equipment, but if you they are using consumables that we, the commission is providing, you do need to collect the monies for those items. Uh, Joanne will talk to you about consumables later on, and you will be receiving a price list for all of the consumables that we provide, and those prices do include the taxes so that which we will pay to the Department of Revenue, so you don't have to worry about those, okay? We do um, ask that you allow any visitor who um, has taken the training or whether at your library or one of the other libraries that has participated in this project um, to use the equipment. There are some minimum age requirements that we will ask you to post and we'll be talking about those a little bit later. We actually have a chart that tells you what training and what age requirements um, there are for each different piece of equipment. We also um, really want to encourage entrepreneurship. That's one of the main uh, components of this particular grant. So makers can use the equipment for both personal and commercial use. We do ask that you make sure that the consumables that um, are for sale are not immediately accessible to the patrons because you do want to make sure that you are collecting the monies for those items and then you shouldn't be offering refunds for any consumables that people have actually purchased and used. Okay. Yeah it's really easy and, and Max can speak to this that really anytime you're making something you do have mm -hmm. some bugaboos where it doesn't quite work out right. and, you, and you ruin that t-shirt or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you wanna throw in that that's just a part of making or? Yeah, I mean, that's something when I talk to people uh, about using this equipment, I always plan to bring two of something. You know, this is the thing I actually care about. This is the thing I'm gonna practice on. Um, and if I make any mistakes, I'll do it on the practice one. Now I'm ready for the actual piece that I really care about. Yeah, so sometimes so, they're buying a consumable and then it doesn't quite turn out like they wanted. Right. But, mm -hmm. but they did use the consumable. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Users may bring in their own consumables for almost all of the different pieces of equipment. The one exception is for the 3D printer. That filament um, need, is very specific to the 3D printer that is part of this project. So. You, they have to use what is provided by the commission for that piece of equipment. If they do bring in their own items for some of the pieces of equipment, we do ask that you approve what they're using because, and Max can talk more about the noxious fumes and things that can damage machines that you do need to be aware of. Right. Uh, when you take the train the trainer trainings to learn how to teach people how to use this equipment, we actually go over approved and banned materials for all of the machines, all of the equipment, uh, and you know how to identify those, where the lists are, so you can readily go and find that information and get someone a really quick answer. Mm -hmm. And then the last item on this screen is that the maker agrees the library is not responsible for failed projects. And that relates back to the like consumables again, but also if they bring in their own materials, um, 
they really need to be aware that there are no guarantees with these machines. So if somebody um, has a, a, some textile that is very important to them, but they want to do embroidery on it, they really need to be aware that there's no guarantee that that embroidery machine is not going to jam or make a mess out of that textile. So they just need to be aware of that. And these um, uh, policies are required reading as part of the, live, the uh, studio use and release agreement. So the makers do have to read these and understand all of these policies too. Okay, so <clears throat> the agreement has to be signed and if uh, the maker is under the age of 19, they do need a parent or legal guardian to sign the use and release agreement. We do mention that in the policies that all of your other policies, your other regular policies related to behavior or anything else within the library also applies to the studio. And therefore you do have the right to suspend or deny access to the studio for anybody who fails to follow the policies. Okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Chris is popping things up and <laughs> confusing no, me here. I'm just double checking the so, settings. Okay. Um, all makers do have to participate in training according to a uh, use and training chart that we will talk about here just in, in a few minutes. We do ask people to provide their um, email addresses when they become sort of when they uh, are trained become certified to use equipment and are entered into the database because we do use those email addresses to contact people just to survey them as to um, what impact the use of the studio had on them and and so that we can use that in reporting on the grant. And earlier, Deborah had mentioned uh, if someone receives training in a different library, the certification database is how we maintain that information, how we track all of it. Uh, so it's really easy for you to go in, look up a specific person, and see whether or not they have received training on a specific piece of equipment. Yes. And, and we have seen a lot of experience with mm -hmm. when that uh, studio moves to the community 30, 60 miles away, somebody knows that they want to etch some more glasses and they will uh, go follow those follow studios the to the next community. <laughs> so having that uh, database that you can get into to check their certification is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And Max, I don't know if you want to talk in just a little bit about uh, the training mm -hmm. and how important it is to um, you know, making sure people are trained. Right, so uh, I always tell people training is making sure that you're not gonna hurt yourself and you're not gonna hurt the equipment. Uh, we go over the standard operating procedures, so basically how to use this machine, right? Uh, it's not gonna go over how to be an absolute artisan master on this machine, uh, but it's gonna get you to the point where you are more comfortable uh, and you're qualified to use this stuff. Uh, so it uh, covers a pretty broad swath of information uh, and ultimately gets you to the point where you can safely use it. Okay. There are just a few pieces of equipment and we'll touch on those a little bit later, but things like the iron or the steamer that don't require actual training. We ask that you give them a few guidelines, but there's no real training required, but they do have to basically agree to use all everything in a safe and proper manner. Okay, <clears throat> there, the, the way that you determine whether somebody has been certified on a piece of equipment is up to you. One suggestion is that makers sign in at the front desk and then staff can therefore verify that um, the person has completed the training, but we've made this one optional. You can choose 
whatever way works best for you. So you might establish a studio equipment reservation system, you, um, or you might use some other way of determining whether the person has received the training or not. You also may choose to limit the amount of time that someone spends on any one piece of equipment. Um, if you know, you've know you got 20 people who are really interested in using that laser cutter, you, um, you might <laughs> want to say one person can only use it for an hour at a time and then the next person is up. So you might want some kind of reservation system or you might want to um, say first come first serve but you can still limit the amount of time that someone is actually using for it on it. Okay. <clears throat> some of the equipment must never leave the library during the hosting period. Um, once we set it up it should pretty much stay exactly where it is as it is. Uh, you don't really want to be fooling with it. However, there are a, a few other pieces of equipment that may be checked out for programming or um, promotion with local, pro, uh, local project partners. And those local project partners are not just those entities that we've identified as being partners, the UNL Extension, et cetera. It's also your local partners. So any group or entity within your town that you have partnered with to promote this uh, project, those people may also check items out for programming, et cetera. Right. And that will be up to the library. Uh, on those machines that we allow out of the, the library, the library can say, no, we don't want anything leaving our library. But it will be up to you uh, on those items that we would allow uh, on how you're going to handle that. And, and how you identify those local project partners. So you might say it's fine for uh, the school, the public school, the, um, the obviously the extension educator, um, could be the Chamber of Commerce. So how you design that uh, is, is fine with us. You know, obviously people that you work with and, and will be supporting your project. And then there are a few things that can be checked out by the patrons, like the camera. We don't insist that they can only use the camera inside the library. Might wind up being some very boring pictures. <laughs> so to actually um, <clears throat> take a chart, look at the chart that we've been talking about. This chart is actually on the last page okay. of the policies um, that Joanne sent. And you can see that we've uh, identified which pieces of equipment require the SOP or standard operating procedure training. We've given um, a minimum amount of time that the training should occur. We've identified safety equipment that is required for some of the pieces of equipment. We've specified which items can be checked out according to um, our guidelines. But as Joanne said, you can make it more restrictive than that if you wish. And then we've also listed the minimum ages for people using it either unsupervised or supervised. These are the minimum. So you can actually decide to include a, um, to change an age to a higher age, an older age, but you cannot make any of these a younger age. Okay, And then you'll notice that there are a few items like, as I mentioned, the iron and steamer, the glue gun label maker, that um, we just ask that you cover a, a little bit of housekeeping, you know, five minutes, mm -hmm. reminding people to unplug it, put it away, do whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we've also had uh, a lot of questions from li library staff, especially the children's library, mm -hmm. where um, they say, well, you say that no one under 12 can be certified on this machine. Um, and we know we have an 11 year old that would, would really like to use that. And really, 
it really is going to fall back on, okay, so it's not necessarily the 11 year old, but it's somebody who's taking responsibility. Max, do you mm -hmm. want to kind of go over that? Yeah. So, well, let's just look at the very first one, the CNC router, for example. Uh, our age minimum for unsupervised is 18. So if you have an 18 year old that comes in and takes the training on it, we are fine with them using the equipment without any oversight of any kind. Uh, now our age minimum for supervised is 12. So say a 13 year old, or sorry, a 12 year old comes in uh, and wants to use this equipment. Uh, for that, we'll need someone that knows how to use the equipment and can spot potential problems in the area, monitoring, seeing what's going on, uh, and ultimately being able to stop something bad from happening before it occurs. Now, say you've got a 10-year-old or 11-year-old that comes in and wants to use it, uh, they fall below that minimum requirement. Uh, they'll need someone either above the age of 18 that can use the equipment and basically they're the one responsible for pressing go. They're the one responsible for actually making the thing happen. The 10 year old can certainly give them guidance on, I want this design here, I want it to look like this, but ultimately that of age person does need to be trained and qualified and responsible for the project. Uh, likewise, if it was a supervised person, uh, then they will just need to have a third person that knows the equipment uh, and can kind of spot those potential hazards. Mm -hmm. And really, we also see from library to library, um, and depending on the time of uh, the staff that you might have at the library, it's possible that you have somebody at the library that is fulfilling that supervisory mm -hmm. role. And other libraries say, well, we don't have a staff that can just go over to that CNC router and help with that. And so they're bringing in their their dad or their big brother or whoever mm -hmm. that is also certified. So that supervised person right. could be somebody at the library, but, but it doesn't could, have to be. It doesn't have to be. You can say we really don't have the staff mm -hmm. to do that. Right. We had a question and you just went and answered before I could even tell you what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Rose wanted to know so the supervision can come from the library staff and you just yes. before I could even say she had something she Yes. She says thanks. Yep. <laughs> preemptively answering yeah. your question. <laughs> so, any other questions before nope, we go on? That's it for now. Oh. If anybody has any questions, you can type them into the question section if you go to webinar interface, or um, you can unmute yourself and just, you know, jump in and say, excuse me, it's so-and-so from li so -and -so library, and I want to ask about whatever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, next up is are our restrictions. <laughs> um, we do ask that the maker not use the studio equipment to make any items that are prohibited by law, unsafe, obscene, etc. Um, whether how closely you monitor everything um, is up to you, as we mentioned. These are policies that the maker is required to read um, to use the equipment, so they should be aware of this. And you know, you can monitor as as needed. Okay. I have two specific cases to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Uh, we had a patron that wanted to 3D print a dagger for a costume. Uh, we decided that ultimately, even though the dagger wasn't sharp, um, couldn't really cut anyone. Uh, it still posed a, a little bit of a hazard as far as stabbing. Uh, so we said a no-go for that one. We also had a police officer come in and want to laser engrave uh, some stuff on the side of his firearm. Uh, and we ultimately said no for that, uh, just from you know the perspective of we really don't want to get involved with anything related to that. Uh, in addition, the laser actually isn't capable of marking on that specific thing, but that's a whole other story. And then, of course, just like with your copier, <laughs> you have to tell people that they need to follow all the applicable intellectual property laws. Okay. We do ask users to leave equipment in the same or better condition than they actually found it, uh, with the one exception being that they, if they create a robot with the Lego Mindstorm and it fits in the gray tote, they don't have to take that back apart again. Makers should be aware that they need to take, take precautions 
so that they don't cause a mess or damage to any of the equipment. Okay, and of course we do ask no food, gum, or drinks anywhere near that equipment. Okay. <clears throat> we also want makers to be aware that the libraries, um, we don't expect the libraries to be responsible for any items that the that people might leave behind or might leave on the computer. At one point, we um, had planned on making the computers um, automatically, automatically erased, erased. erased. At yes. the end of the evening. <laughs> yep. And that didn't quite work out with the, the software. So um, we have not implemented anything that would uh, remove or change digital files, but there's no guarantee that the next maker who comes in and uses that computer might not change or delete mm -hmm. what was already there. So if people want to retain what they created um, through Corel Draw or whatever other uh, software, they really should save it to a flash drive and take it with them, okay? And then, of course, the, the next one's optional, but um, if uh, you have supplies that have been donated or you're providing some supplies, you could put in a, um, a policy asking that uh, makers avoid wasting any of those supplies. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> the next set of policies relates specifically to safety because mm -hmm. we do want to make sure that makers don't hurt themselves or mm -hmm. others or damage equipment. Uh -huh. And perhaps uh, Max might want to take this safety sure. slide just sure. because you always do our safety training. Yep. Uh, so you'll likely hear a lot of the same stuff from me uh, again when I'm in your libraries or when you're here for uh, the training in Lincoln. Uh, but first and foremost, right, we do have specific uh, equipment safety procedures, so make sure that you're following all of those. We do have some specific attire that is going to help you be safer and more successful. So we're talking gloves from heat press, we're talking making sure that any loose hair is tied up, long necklaces put away, things like that. Uh, we really recommend closed-toed shoes. You know, if in the event that you drop something, it's going to potentially damage the shoe instead of your foot, which could be an issue. Uh, and making sure that anything that can get caught in this equipment, we have a few pieces with exposed machinery, uh, making sure that it's tucked away, taken care of, uh, and not going to get otherwise caught there. Uh, we also would recommend that you not use headphones uh, or earbuds or cell phones while you're operating the machine. Uh, my big go-to is I had a teacher once that really recommended you be where your hands are, uh, and that's really important with this equipment that you pay attention to what's going on. Uh, you know, a, a few seconds here or there could mean the difference between uh, being able to salvage some of your work or having to throw it away. Right, and say for instance, if you're doing something on the 3D printer and for whatever reason it's not sticking to the base of the mm -hmm. mat, uh, you can see that it's going awry, right. uh, stop the machine, and then you'll probably only used up two grams of filament exactly. rather than 50 grams of filament, right. which is really going to uh, decrease the cost of what you, you're having to buy. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can say too, with the sewing machine, um, you don't have to sit there watching it take every single stitch uh, in the embroidery, but you need to be close enough that if you hear it start going tom, 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 you need to stop it right away right. because it's jamming. So. And speaking of, uh, you do need to be present while all this equipment is running. Uh, the exception to that is a long 3D print job. It's common for those to run overnight uh, or in some cases over a couple of days. So we're fine with you not being there the whole time that's running. Uh, but you do need to be able to respond very quickly if there's an issue on one of these machines. Uh, if there is an issue where maybe a part breaks or it's not behaving correctly, uh, get in touch with one of us, either someone at the Library Commission uh, or get in touch with me via our forum or just some way basically let us know that there's a problem rather than letting this machine run for a couple of weeks uh, either at half performance or just not really working. Uh, that way we can get new parts out to you and otherwise fix the problem. Uh, same thing, if you do have any injuries that result from this, uh, make sure that 
the makers report that to your staff so that you can address those concerns. You know, if you have a, a sharp corner on something, uh, you can sand that down and potentially prevent other people from getting hurt from that. And really, the majority of the machines that we provide in the library innovation studio setting mm -hmm. is really, uh, most of them are very safe. For instance, the laser cutter, even though it's doing a lot of stuff in there, it doesn't actually operate unless that lid is down. So sure. it's not like you can put your hand and get it hurt. Now, in a regular makerspace, it might be different. That laser cutter might be a whole different brand right. and work differently. Uh, yeah. But there still are a few things like the heat press that gets very hot um, that you could hurt yourself. Right. If, for the most part, this all the equipment we have was chosen because it's difficult to hurt yourself on it. You have to be almost out of your way um, to purposefully try to do it. So, uh, speaking of hot things, we do have some items that do get very hot and you could potentially burn yourself if you didn't know they were still hot. So uh, makers will need to make sure that they unplug and turn off this equipment before they walk away. Uh, preferably, they stay with the equipment while it's cooling off. At a bare minimum, though, they need to take that up to the front desk and communicate to the desk worker, hey, this is hot. It's going to be hot for another 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they can kind of figure out what to do with it from there. Uh, in general, any unsafe behavior uh, is something to avoid. Uh, this is kind of the catch-all, just you know, don't be a, a goofus. Uh, don't run around trying to break stuff. Uh, we might, you might, as a library, want to limit the number of people that can watch some equipment as it's running. It can be difficult to be here and focus on what the laser is doing if you've got 40 people cycling through trying to watch what you're doing and asking a lot of questions. So you might need to kind of limit you know, only two or three people uh, in that area at a time. And you may, there we go, uh, you may need to deny access if people fail to follow this. So uh, general stuff that you may have seen before in your library, if someone is flagrantly violating the rules, uh, you know, we give you the permission to say, no, thank you. Uh, you're not allowed to come use this equipment anymore. Okay, so we kind of went through all of the items on um, the policies itself. Does anybody have any questions? And I think we still have plenty of time left okay. in our one hour webinar. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Honestly, yeah, if you have any questions, you can either type them into the questions section or I'm just double checking here. Yep. I didn't miss anybody. Everybody on my side, you are unmuted. Um, if you have a microphone, you can just use it to ask your question. Um, but most of you have self-muted yourselves. So you'd need to unmute on the GoToWebinar interface, that little microphone icon there, if you did want to ask something. Mm -hmm. and I, um I might want to mention one thing as we're waiting for those questions to come in. Uh, one of the policies mentioned uh, not to have uh, the consumables that we bring in. And just to give you an idea of what we bring in to have at the library is uh, filament for the 3D printer, uh, wood, uh, glassware. Both of those are for the laser cutter. Wood is also for the CNC router. We For the heat press. Uh, and printers, we bring in uh, T-shirts, aprons, uh, bags that you can heat press a design on. Uh, there's also aprons for the for the embroidery machine, uh, vinyl for the vinyl cutter. Obviously, people don't want to order a 10-yard roll of red vinyl mm -hmm. if they only want five inches of mm -hmm. red vinyl. Um, and I'm sure there's other things as well that I uh, haven't said, but we, you'll notice that one of the policies says that those consumables should be readily accessible to people in the library. We do know there are some exceptions. For instance, that 3D filament, many libraries keep that box right on, right next to the 3D printer because it is kind of a heavy thing. And, and so if you think that it's in a position where you can easily monitor that somebody isn't just picking up a roll of filament, making that 3D print job and walking out with you uh, without you noticing it, then it actually is fine to have it right next there. And same with the vinyl. A lot of people keep that vinyl right next to that vinyl cutter. But again, it's 
can't keep the monitor. Right. We've seen some libraries that choose to keep all of that behind the desk so that you have to go specifically ask someone for it. We've also seen plenty of cases where people leave it out right by the equipment. Uh, we have one question that has come in um, about thumb drives. They want to know um, if thumb drives come with the equipment or I need to get some on hand for patron purchase. Uh -huh. Like they have their own we, designs on there. Yeah, guys. we do supply uh, a quantity of thumb drives. They're 16 gig uh, at $8 pop. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you'll have it. Those will come. And so you'll have those. And my big push you'll hear a lot uh, is I like cloud based services. So I recommend a number of uh, online storage options Google Drive, Box, Dropbox, uh, all free services that work anywhere you've got an internet connection. And even another one here. Do the laptops or computers need access to a printer at our library? Um, no. Um, now it's possible that they might be designing it and want to and print off uh, what they've kind of already drawn out. Um, the only, uh, first of all, in in our studio, we provide. Uh, four desktop computers. Those desktop top computers are hooked to our major machines, the laser cutter, the CNC router, the vinyl cutter, and um, the 3D printer. And then we also bring in two laptops. Uh, those laptops also have Corel Draw on them, and those can be used uh, to design other projects. Um, the Two printers that we bring in have specialty ink, so they're really not to print off uh, what you've been working on or something that you found on the web. But those printers have, one has pigment ink and one has sublimation ink. And that's what you're going to be running through with the heat transfer paper. So then you can do a print on that t-shirt or that bag or that ink print. Um, so, yeah, you don't need um, access to an office printer for any of this equipment. If a patron did want to print off uh, homework or whatever, uh, then you would just go through your regular policy. And uh, if you are offering that service to patrons, then go through that. I did think of one thing that they will need a color printer for if the patron wants to do it. Uh, so one of our pieces of equipment is the button maker. Uh, somebody might bring in a picture of their 20 grandkids and they want to print those pictures on uh, bright white paper um, and so they would be using the library's printer, color printer, if they want to do that at the library and then of course you're charging them for whatever you would normally charge for that color mm -hmm. print. Right. But with that they would be using the library's computer as well. Probably. They would. Yes. They wouldn't need to have the studio, com a studio computer, hooked up to a library printer. Right. Correct. Right. right. Okay. Any other questions? Type them in, or unmute yourself and ask. Should we go with that? We do have uh, project uh, web pages on the Nebraska Library Commission website, and that is the address. Um, you can also go, if you can't think of that address, and you go to the Nebraska Library Commission website, you can search for either Library Innovation Studio, Makerspaces, um, anything similar, and you will find our project web pages. This is the front page, uh, the main page, as you can see in the green box to the right, um, you can um, get to uh, training videos and, and Max can mention a little bit about those, recorded webinars, this, that's where today's webinar will be as well, and you can find also great webinars there for you to bring yourself up to speed on um, getting ready for your hosting period. We have pictures of all the equipment and how they operate. Um, equipment instructions. So Max mentioned SOPs. You might want to mention how you can get to those here. Yep, so those equipment instructions are the digital copies. We do provide physical uh, copies and binders of all of our standard operating procedures for all of our equipment. Uh, 
so if you are at home wanting to do some research before you come in to take the laser class, you can open that SOP up and do some reading for yourself and uh, just kind of get in the right mindset. Joanne had also mentioned some of our training videos uh, on the previous page. There are a couple of training videos for the general safety presentation that I give, as well as the Slack cart forum that we use. Uh, oh, look at that, I'm wearing glasses. Wow. Uh, and then a little farther down the page, we do have some kind of prep videos for if you want to see in general what the vinyl cutter is capable of doing or what the CNC router kind of looks like while it's operating. These two to three minute videos will give you a rough idea and kind of hit the high points. Uh, again, it's kind of a little bit of preparation for training to just get you in the right mindset. Uh, we also have a great uh, page called Community Engagement. That will help you get your local teams ready. Um, uh, we have a welcome web webinar on there that you can click on. Uh, that's where we visited a little bit about uh, how to organize in your community. There's a worksheet on forming your community action team, how to form your training team. Um, there's information about event planning, um, and then just all kinds of good information. There's also a communications a tab on the right, um, and that, um, thanks to uh, Tessa Terry here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we have a great media kit, um, uh, templates for posters and press releases, uh, there was a PowerPoint above. So if you want to go to Kiwanis Club and start talking to them about what is coming to your library, you can just uh, download that PowerPoint and edit, edit it however you like. Uh, there's just a lot of great information about media on this communications uh, web or web page, I should say. So do take a look at everything that you can find on our web pages because um, in most cases, it's up there. Uh -huh. And of course, we did this not only for our host libraries, but of course, since we got uh, funding from IMLS, the Federal Library Agency, uh, we want to be able to have this available for all libraries in the United States, um, whether they're doing a similar project or just looking to to have a maker space in their library and they want to know how to promote it. Uh, they might want to look at our instruction sheets. Obviously our instruction sheets are uh, tailored to the particular pieces of equipment that we purchased, uh, but it will also give them a good idea of how to develop those. <laughs> No other questions have come in while you were talking. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just some final thoughts uh, for you thinking about your particular hosting period coming up. We do have, every time we have a new cycle of libraries that will be taking on those four um, sets of maker uh, space components that we have. Uh, we have a training in Lincoln that you send a few trainers to. Um, and then, but then we also hold training at your library. So some of your trainers will be trained twice, once in Lincoln and then again in your library. Uh, but each training, whether it's here in Lincoln or at your library, is to train your trainers. We're not tra training your general public, but if you have, have identified those people that you think are gonna be good trainers for any piece of equipment, um, then uh, that's who we're training. Mm -hmm. And it might be that you go, oh, the Lego Mindstorm, hmm, can't think of anybody, but I know a young man uh, that might be able to be a good trainer on that and then invite them in to come mm -hmm. to that training too. Even if he's not totally committed, <laughs> uh, maybe somebody can learn that piece of uh, electronic, the robotics kit. Um, 
On this particular contact information, uh, again, that's me, Joanne McManus, the project manager. Cynthia Nye is our uh, project assistant, and she works with me hand in hand. Uh, and so actually when people um, email in and ask questions or want more consumables or whatnot, I generally ask people to send both Cynthia and I an email. That way, one of us will be in the office and can respond to you. Uh, and of course, always keeping in touch with uh, Max, uh, who is our trainer out at the Nebraska Innovation Studio. Uh, if you're really having trouble with a piece of equipment, mm -hmm. um, Max is also a good contact person. Mm -hmm. Any any last thoughts? Any last minute questions you want to ask? We still have the chance. This is Jody from McCook. Hi, Jody. <laughs> As a procrastinator and one in the last group that to host one of these things, um, all of this information sounds just overwhelming. What would be your suggestion and kind of a timeline to start either watching the webinars or visiting one of the libraries that has hosting them right now? Where would you start? Um, you do want to get started in advance. Uh, you're in our last hosting cycle, so you'll be taking training pretty much the end of February next year, and you'll be getting your equipment that very, well, first week in April of next year. But you do want to, you don't want to wait until next January to start thinking about this, mm -hmm. because first of all, it takes a while to uh, find people that will serve as your trainers. A lot of our libraries do not have, um, you know, an abundance of staff. And so you really do need to tap into your extension educators, um, people at the high, high school, uh, might be the person that has the, the quilting shop. Uh, there's just a lot of people in your community that are already kind of crafty. And um, and so it's it's good to start thinking ahead of time and presenting what is coming and then try to get uh, people interested um, so you can develop your uh, community action team and identify your trainers in advance. Uh, as far as you mentioned visiting a library that currently has the equipment, I'd recommend uh, take a look at the schedule, and if you are going to be in an area with a library innovation studio in it now, or if you'll be there in five months, uh, call up the library director. Call up whoever is uh, with that project at that library, and I'm sure they will love to show you around, uh, explain their experience, uh, answer some of maybe your really hands-on questions, mm -hmm. um, or if you know as you're thinking of stuff. Go ahead, send it to any of us, and we will get you some answers, get you going. Um, but yeah, the earlier you can get out to a site and see kind of what it actually looks like, I think that'll maybe help you feel a little more comfortable with the process. Mm -hmm. And of course, Grant, Nebraska, will have um, a makerspace in the cycle right before you. They'll get theirs in uh, mid-November. And so maybe taking uh, a few people from your uh, committee over to Grant after they have their equipment um, and just that's a bit of a distance yeah well maybe Hastings <laughs> is closer mm -hmm. and and Hastings will get theirs uh, the end of uh, toward the end of June but McCook is just far from you know <laughs> I, I think Grant's not too terribly far from yeah. McCook depends if you want to take your <laughs> I'll have Thank to look you. that up, Deborah. <laughs> Thank you much. Uh huh. Well, I was going to say uh, we're all looking forward to seeing your shining faces either in Lincoln or at some point on the road. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else to say, but I wanted to say thanks for uh, coming and uh, glad to hear from some of you. Yeah, and don't uh, feel free to call or email anytime.
I get lots of questions and I don't mind responding to them. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Rose Levis just is so excited. Much thanks for this opportunity. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. All right. All right. Thank you.